This new year is full of hope, isn't it? We've been talking about hope. It's such an important topic for us to really know. Hope is essential to not only the human experience, the Christian experience. Hope is something that we have to hang on to. It's also in short supply in our world today. And we've been talking about, right, like, you know, it's good to start the new year off, to make some good commitments, to make some changes, to allow God to really change our hearts from the inside out. We talked about how God is at work behind the scenes and is always doing something and moving and orchestrating things, building our lives in a way that all of a sudden we come to this moment and when it seems super random of like, wow, look at this thing that's happening, and then you reflect and look on it and look at what God has been doing behind the scenes. Things that you didn't know were working. People that you didn't know were all connecting and coming together. And that kind of perspective for me gives me a lot of hope. But I want to talk about hope because when I say the word hope, I think we need to back up a little bit. Because when I say hope, right, like we had it with the kids here, we talked about hope, but what does that word even mean? I mean, really. When I think about the word hope, right, is it, it's a thing that you possess, right? I have hope, like it's a thing that I can hold, like I have hope that these good things are going to happen. Is it an action that you do, right? Like this is something that I, like I hope that this happens, and so as long as I do that, then I'm bound to get what I want, I'm about... Things are bound to work out much better for me. Maybe it's a thing, right? Again, to be possessed. Maybe it's a feeling. Is hope a feeling? Maybe just a positive vibe that things are going to kind of work out. Or maybe is it actually a worry? When we say, I hope, well, I hope that doesn't happen, what is that actually saying? What you're saying is, I'm super worried about something, right? I hope this tragedy does not befall me. I hope things don't go to the worst possible scenario that I just cannot shake out of my head. Maybe it's a location, right? My hope is in, and I put my hope in things. But when I think about that, and I, I've been thinking a lot about hope, and I think we've, we've uncovered some really beautiful aspects, but there's something deeper I want us to notice about hope. Something more core and central to the human experience. Something that gets you down, deep down in the gut. There's this essence of hope that I want to try and uncover here today. Because really when I think about hope, like is it here and now? Is the hope for me here and now or is it there and then? Like is the hope for us right now here or is hope in our life some distant thing that we kind of, you know, just vaguely aspire to, right? That it's, it's out in the distance, it's out there is there hope to be seen today in our everyday experience, or is it just something off in the distant, only for the future? And if I ask you, right, and I try and kind of probe a little bit more as you reflect, like, where is your hope? What do you put your hope in? Where does your hope come from? If I, to if I ask you what the source of your hope is, what might you say? And you know, the topic of hope is great, so when we come to church... And we get to hear this just really nice, warm, fuzzy message of hope. Oh, it's going to be so warm and fuzzy today, isn't it? No. Y'all know me better than that, don't you? <laughs> I mean, come on, right? You ready for the warm fuzzies here? Yeah, we'll, we'll do some of that. Don't worry, we're going to get there. But um, we kind of got to do the other side, don't we? What is that? Uh, there's this old expression that I heard, a nautical term, not that I'm super familiar, but... Uh, Calm seas don't make good sailors. Y'all heard that before? When we talk about things like hope and faith, when we talk about those, I mean, they're, they're central to the Christian worldview and the ideology, but it's central to our human experience as well. It's a thing that when we tap into hope and faith, it translates in a universal way to other people. It's like a language everyone speaks. Not everybody knows what's going on, but they feel it. They sense it. It's all over you, right? It's all, you're all about it. But the truth is that if I think about hope and I think about faith, like, it's only in relation to the trials and troubles that are there. Everyone can be super positive when everything's going well, right? I mean, yeah, I got a rock-solid faith that's unshakable. I have zero doubts in my life when everything's going well. But the truth is, if we think about our human experience and we're really honest about our situation, 
You know, some of us right now have that deep, unsettled sense. I believe that this is rampant in our culture today. I see it so often. I think on the surface level, we're pretty good. I think we're floating pretty well, but then there's this undercurrent. So I want to talk about that calm seas and undercurrents because I want us to dig down on what this hope really is because, again, hope like faith is tested and shown when you're really in trouble. And if I were to say, what are you hoping for? You know, let's think about the world. Let's, let's pull the lens out. Let's look at the macro, the world environment. Let's look at our world today. Where's your hope? What are you hopeful for in our world today? There's a lot going on, and I've got to tell you, I'm concerned by a lot of things I see. I'm a bit concerned when I look at the world around me. Are you? I've got some concerns because I think I see a lot of people whose hope is being put in a practical way into the political battlefield that is about to unfurl on our society here imminently, right? Our hope is if we can, if we can just keep the right guys in office or we can get the other guys in office, right, then everything's going to be good. You know, it's a real interesting contradiction because there's so many people who think government is, is kind of terrible, uh, that government itself is actually the, the most evil thing, right? Like, it's the barrier to our happiness, and yet how many people are putting their faith and their stock and their hope in that very same government to fix all the issues that we have? I don't get that at all. But you think about it, right? And like, the, the politics is like a, I don't know, it's like a train gaining speed, ain't it? It's like, it's ramping up now. And it's only going to get faster and faster, isn't it? But, but I want you to think about that, right? Like, you know, that's a whole thing. It's a whole cycle. And there's all this, like, emotion that we tie to it. But I want you to think about it in terms of hope. If our hope is really in that the right political party, whichever side you believe that that is, if your hope is in, well, as long as the right political party gets in, we're going to be good. I think that's a shallow place to put your hope. And I'm concerned. I'm also concerned when I kind of think about these ideas, right, of um, in, our, in our society today, there's a lot of this talk about disparity and inequality and other aspects like that, right, unfairness, or I don't have what I think I should have, or I don't have what I think I'm supposed to have, and so all of a sudden we start to look at these disparities, and we start to look at, well, what are the correlations and what is it, and so all of a sudden you've got this growing mentality, especially among younger people of like, what we need to do is dismantle this thing. You heard that word, dismantle? I don't think that's the solution. But people are putting their hope in that, aren't they? The hope is that if we can just dismantle this thing, oh, then we can rebuild it and make it all better and everything's going to be fine. But I got to tell you, I'm concerned about this. People putting their hope in dismantling. The other one from a spiritual sense, right? We've talked about the political aspect, but I want you to think on a spiritual level. The rampant rise in this thing called deconstructionism. You heard this? Deconstructing my faith? Oh. You know, this is kind of a fallout from a lot of postmodern ideology. So we're talking about 10, 20, 30 years ago, to be honest. But what's happening is it's creeping into church circles, and all of a sudden people are saying, well, you know, I just need to deconstruct my faith. Now, some of you are saying, like, what are you even talking about? What does that mean? Well, I learned about this word first from cooking shows. And I remember seeing it, and they're like, this is a deconstructed hamburger. And I was like, what? And so what they did is they they took a hamburger, as you would know it, and they took all the ingredients, and they just kind of put it individually on a plate. So in other words, they took the thing, they took it apart. So like the meat's over here, the bread's over here, and then they zhuzh it up and they, you know, make it different and all that, and it's a deconstructed. But right now, there's a popular trend around deconstructing people, people deconstructing their faith. Like, I was raised in this overly religious, rules-focused kind of house. Like, you know, it was all about my compliance to the rules, and I want to fight against that. And I'm try- so I just need to deconstruct my whole faith. Tear it down. Forget everything I know. And the problem is when you do that and you break it all down to the bare components, what you're left with, if you take a building, any building you want, you take a building and you reduce it down to its essential components and flatten them out, what do you have? You have a pile of rubble. You ain't got nothing. 
And I think a lot of people's faith is turning into a stack of bricks right now, deconstructing my faith. What you see in our culture is really, it's rampant. And even the people who are not saying, well, I'm deconstructing, because that sounds like kind of pretentious and I sound like super smart. I'm an intellectual, I'm deconstructing my faith, right? It sounds like I'm really a smart person. But what a lot of people, I want you to think about this in a real practical sense too, on, because you do notice it, you do see it, is people saying, it's more about I think than what God says. Our theologies and our religious and spiritual worldviews are so much more today about what I think about the world or what I think about spiritual principles or what I think about God, rather than saying, what does God say about a topic like this? What does Scripture try to teach us? What are the threads within the Bible that can actually enlighten us in these ways? So i got to tell you, I'm really concerned by this. I'm a little worried because people are putting their hope in this idea of deconstruction. Like, what I can do is I can kind of make and form my own faith into the thing that I want it to be, and then that's going to be the way forward, and that's their hope. I think the other thing that people put their hope in, and it's really hard for me, is the spiritual celebrities in our world. So many people, right, like you think about, we'll call it TikTok culture, you can call it whatever you want, right, but this idea of like the celebrities that we follow. Right now what we're seeing in America is we're seeing church attendance fluctuating rapidly, and what you're starting to see is there's a growing segment of the population that rather than being connected in a community where they are seen, where they are known, Right? We talk about being held accountable to people. It just means that you're living your life in relation to others, that you're part of a community, that you're knit together. That if I go off and start living all wild, there's people who know me and will call me and say, hey, what is wrong with you? What are you doing right now? Or if I drop off the face of the earth and you haven't seen me in four weeks here, you're going to call me and say, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Everything all right? But I don't know, I just look at the spiritual celebrities in our world and I just, it's so sad to watch these people with these big ministries fail and fall. And so many people are putting their hope in this one personality, right? Like, I like that guy. He makes me feel good when I listen to him. That's good stuff. And then you find out, whoa, he's living a double life. Scandal, tragedy, trauma wreckage and destruction in their wake, you know? Because if our hope is really in the celebrities, we're going to be let down as well. It concerns me. These are all places people put their hope in, but I think more so to this in the spiritual sense, our hope is always challenged. You see, it's so essential to our human experience. It's so essential to what it means to be a Christian. Hope is so core and so vital for each one of us that you better believe the enemy's main tactic is to try and put it under a full-on assault. Cast doubts, take it away, make things look bad, and so all of a sudden we've got these negative worldviews. We're focused on all the negative things, and if not, and the all-out assault happens. Why? Because it's so important. Hope is so important for us. And I think about, like, what's getting in the way of my hope? I think it's important for us to face that too, right? It's important that we have hope and all these things, but it's important to us, for each one of us, to look at the opposition to the hope that we have and how it shows up in each of our lives. And this is where, like, the rubber hits the road and things get real practical and tactical in your anxiety, whatever the latest stress or latest unknown for you. That hurts your hope, doesn't it? Especially when it's an unexpected stress, or it's the unknown of, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this jam. I don't know how this thing that seems to be wrecked is ever going to get better. I don't know how these relationships are ever going to get repaired and restored. How will we reconcile? It's about what's getting in the way, right? And we're talking about it's the hard stuff of life, the things that get in the way of our hope. And if it's not anxiety, right, there's so many different aspects. I mean, is it like depression? Does that get in the way of our hope? So many people, like, they find themselves in this deeply sad state. Existence is futile. You know, that kind of thing really wrecks your sense of hope. 
but it can also be seen in anger. Maybe that's where the rubber hits the road for you. It's me. It's me focus. You see, here's the thing about people that are really angry. They're a bit selfish most of the time because they don't think about anybody else. They're just thinking about themselves, right? And so all of a sudden, we're getting triggered. We're flying off the handle. We're really quick to get mad. Like, you know, when the situation doesn't really match the emotional response, it should always be a warning sign to you. Red flag. Somebody says something a little bit, and all of a sudden, the outrage and the offense starts to swell. And it's like, what did they say to me? Oh, no. Mm -mm. You know, like really quickly, just getting mad. And, and sometimes that that can attack your hope as well. If you're in a hopeful state, you're not going to be full of anxiety and depressed or angry all the time or numb. In our world today, there's so much of this. The recommendation to us is that we just need to let the thing be what it is. Like this generically nonsense spiritual talk that we see out there of people who profess to have the way to higher truth and enlightenment and say, well, you just got to, you know, call the thing it is what it is. Just let the thing be what it'll be. Take all your heart, heartache and frustrations and your dreams that are unrealized and just, just let it be what it is. And if you just numb yourself, then you know it's okay, right? It's a hack. But that apathy, that, apathy, that lack of fight, or maybe it's time and, and, and just waiting, right? That you, you have a hope, you have a dream, but it has not happened and you are in this place of waiting. And there's this proverb that I go back to. It's Proverbs 13, verse 12. It says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And when I think about that feeling, oh, let me read it again. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I mean, what I'm trying to talk about here is that, that feeling of the heart being sick. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about how the heart was central to all of Jesus' ministry. It's the whole undercurrent of what he talks about. But the truth is that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And it's out of that sickness that we see the dysfunction and the despair that is so rampant in our world today. The problem with many people in our world today is their hearts are sick and they don't know it. But we know that if we don't have hope, if our hope is under assault, if our hope is incomplete or inactive, what happens is it makes the heart sick. It can be really hard to describe feelings like this, right? I'm trying to like intellectually pull you into a feeling right now. So I think sometimes what you need to do is you got to switch modes here. So I'm going to switch modes on you a little bit because there, are, there is a way that art in our world today can speak to us and human nature in a way that other things can't, right? That a song can make you feel in a way that I cannot describe to you. So I want to read you a bit of poetry. It's, I think it captures the feeling. And it's in the style, the biblical style of lament. When we talk about the thing that makes the heart sick, there is this idea of lament, which is pouring your heart out to God. But it's really facing those places where our hearts are sick so that God can inject us with hope and heal us. But sometimes you got to name the thing so that you can get it clean, so that you can conquer it, so that you can reform it and remake it so you can build it. So I'm going to try and name that a little bit. And this one's called The Waiting. It's been a while, a long, slow wait. And there's a heaviness to the wait. Not like the cutting of an edge, but a gradual grinding down of hope. My hope is not gone, but only a fraction remains, and it feels smaller every day. Do I not deserve joy? Would I not appreciate it? Is your plan really to hold out? Our hope is getting thin. There's a quiet and increasingly subtle acceptance that the dream just may not come. In the beginning, our hope was full, and our expectancy was great, and your faithfulness was unquestioned. Your grace and mercy were assured, but we're drying up. It's ever more difficult to accept when the joy is around us, but not for us. We suffer silently, still dreaming, dreaming of the day when you will make known why we could not have this gift, 
why our time never came, and why it wasn't part of the plan. I pray we can understand how the answer could be no. How our longing could be unsatisfied, how our pain could be then multiplied. But may your grace be greater than our shame. May your name be greater than our fate. And may your faith, may our faith be greater than our pain. You know, this is describing a sick heart, isn't it? And sometimes I think we've got to be able to face the depths. And sometimes we've got to be able to go to God with the things that are really those broken places in our life. Because when we're broken and lost, that's where we need God's healing, light, and transformation. The joy that comes in the morning is what the Bible says. And you know, I've, I've read this to you before. Any of you remember this? I read this to you before, but I didn't tell you where it's from, did I? I wrote that. Can you believe that? No. <laughs> Years ago now, but you know, you know my story, so much of my story is essential to having Isabel in our life. And we waited and walked a hard road for 10 years before she came. And that was a really hard place to be. And there were times where it just didn't look like there was much hope to that, to be honest, right? That there was this longing and this hope that I had in my heart that I would have a kid, right? And she's, she's incredible. Everything that I wanted. But there was a time where I doubted. Absolutely. Where you just start to wonder, like, oh, maybe that's just not for me. Like, maybe the thing that I hope for, maybe the thing that I'm dreaming of, I'm just never going to get Maybe some of you know what that's like. But what it's doing is it's describing a, a feeling here. And when it says that hope deferred makes a heart sick, my heart was sick in this way. We need to face those things and invite Jesus in. Because the other half of this verse is that hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. She certainly is. This kid teaches me so much about the world and who I am and God. And like, she's just a baby. Oh, I'm sorry, big girl. She's a big girl now. We've talked about that. Yeah. But you know, has your heart ever been sick? Because I bet if you, took, if you did this as an exercise, you'd have your own lament. You would. And sometimes this can be really helpful for us to name the things so that we can invite God into those places. But if I asked you and I said, like, but what would that be? Like, if you were, if you were to sit down and do an exercise of right, like, you know, what would that be for you? Where is your heart sick and where do you need God to step in? What would your lament be? We serve a God who is with us. We serve a God who knows those very places in our life. And... I am a person who believes that prayer is a pretty simple thing. I think when we cry out to God, He knows us. But He wants us to, to go into those places and invite Him in so that He can heal us truly, deeply, and fully. But you know, it's like when it feels like all hope is lost. And I got a call last night. I got a message. Somebody told me that their dad had passed away. And you know, I just, I can't shake it. I couldn't stop as I'm thinking about how I plan the sermon, right? And how, how it's all coming together here. It's about hope. And then it's like, boom, and like the hard stuff of life just keeps getting thrown right in front of us. Right? Like you think when something like that happens and tragedy strikes, right? Like something kind of sudden and abrupt, something you didn't see coming anywhere. And it really derails your hope. And it really is hard for us when all feels lost to retain that sense of hope. But it's there. There is hope. Jesus has it in all of those places. And it's for us. Right here, right now. Not just one day, not just yes, yes at the end, but right here and right now. And that's the good news of the gospel. But I couldn't help think of the story of Lazarus. And I know it's kind of an Easter story, but I'm breaking the mold because that's what I do. You know, the story of Lazarus in John 11 Right? Basically, Jesus is really close to Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and Lazarus is really sick, and they go and they send people and say, hey, you know, come on, our brother's sick, and, and, and Jesus is just about to kind of face the whole Passion Week and, you know, his ultimate death and resurrection. 
And what happens is, is on the way, right, like Lazarus dies. And when he gets there, they say, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And I feel like isn't that the kind of place where the heart's sick, you know? And Jesus goes, and Martha says, right, like, if you had been here. And in verse 25, Jesus says to her, he says, well, in verse 23, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, well, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus in verse 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is a story for a heart that's sick because it's full of hope. What she's saying is, yeah, yeah, I know one day, yeah, at the end, obviously, like he's going to get, you know, resurrected. Yeah, I know about the resurrection that's coming and that one day kind of a thing. But what about the here and now? You should have been here. Where were you? And what she's trying to say is like, my heart was sick here. My hope. Where's my hope? I had hoped you would be here. And it didn't go according to the way that I thought that it would go. But you know, I am the resurrection and the life. Like, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. There's a here and now component to hope. There is hope in the here and now and the troubled things. When the bad news strikes, and even if it's like it's real time, Jesus is right here with us. He is with us walking it out. He's here to heal us. Because death has no power. And there's eternal life, it says, right? Like, it's not only just that death is not the ultimate authority anymore, but it's that we have eternal life. What a beautiful thing that is. And he says, do you believe this? What he's saying is, is like, here's the hope. This is what it is. So hang on to it. Do you believe this? And that's the question posed to each one of us today in those hardest and darkest places when the tragedy strikes. You know, when I think about hope, I want my hope to be like the verse in Hebrews 6, 19. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I don't have to be traumatized by the hardest things in my life because I have a hope in Jesus Christ the way he's remaking me on a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute basis, to be honest. The way that Jesus is involved in my life, that is an anchor for my soul. Faith comes in because I've watched God do so many great things, and how could I not believe what God can do? But it's also about the future for me too. What God will do in my sense of hope, and that thing that I can hold on to as the anchor, sure and certain. There's another Bible passage in in 1 Peter where he talks about the new birth. The idea of Jesus being, giving us eternal life is core to the Christian experience. I mean, it, that's the thing, isn't it? But it's not just do we get to go to heaven because there's life here and now and then there are when things are renewed. You see, as Christians, we don't just hope to just get out of here and kind of go up in the clouds and kind of sit around, right? Like, like when we die, we don't really die because we go to paradise. But guess what? There's something else. Did y'all know that? You know there's something else after that? There's the renewal and restoration of all things. When we are made new. And what God does is He takes all of the old and broken and banged up and mangled things about us and we're still us. And what He does is He makes it all renewed and restored. The renewal of all things is the source of our hope and joy. In the cosmic eternal sense, God making the world right again. And in the here and now though, what we have is a relationship with Jesus and we have the very Spirit of God living in us. The Holy Spirit in our heart, that's God with us. And God's right here, right now. And all I got to do is open up my life and my situation, all of those hurt and broken places to God, and He can heal me. Right here, right now. You see, when I think about hope, is it here and now, or is it there and then? Yeah, it's both. Because right now, the hope that is here for me in the here and now, it's a better me. But then that hope one day when I'm renewed at the renewal of all things, my friends, I will be the best me. And that is a a source of hope for me, for our world today, and for everyone here. When I think about like, okay, what is hope? How should we define it? Can you even name it? That's how we started this whole thing, didn't we? 
I want to go back because what we're trying to say is there is a living hope. And so when, when Peter says, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection is an invitation into new life, but also notice that He says new birth, rebirth. There's the here and now, and there's the there and then. You see, there is new life for us, and there's rebirth in this place. When people talk about being born again, it's an important concept. When people talk about getting baptized, it's an important concept because there's a newness and a freshness. It's a way to take out the old and be made new. It's why the principles of forgiveness and grace and mercy are so central to everything that Jesus talked about. It's a way to take out the old and replace it with something new, something better, something restored. You know, hope can be just warm and fuzzy. But I think we do, it a, we do a little bit of a disservice if that's all it ever is. You see, I want the kind of hope that hits me in my hardest times. I want the kind of hope that gets me through the worst things that happen in life and the things where it doesn't look like there's a way out, but I know in God that there is. He can restore and remake anything. Everything, in fact. You know, hope is about that tree of life. I think about the tree of life, right? Like, so often the cross is described as the tree, but the resurrection is what it's all about. The resurrection of Jesus means there's new life available. That's what that is. The tree of life and the anchor for the soul in times of trouble. We need an anchor for the soul when we're in troubled waters. That's what hope can do for us. And even if we're concerned by what you see in the world, I can still have hope that God is in the here and now and God is working. Even behind the scenes when I don't notice it, God is faithfully working and we will see it one day. And we'll see it perfectly in the coming renewal of all things. And we have help with the things that get in the way for us. All those things that get in the way of our hope, all those things that try and tear down our hope, we have help with that. It's not only God dwelling in us. It's also God remaking us and reforming us and giving that taste of eternity. You see, we know there's something better out there. The human heart knows there's something better than what it is right now. People that are telling you it is what it is are lying to you. And they're setting you up to fail. Because the truth is, is the human heart on a deep, deep level knows there's something more and there's something better. It's part of walking with Jesus. That we've got choices for trust and faith. We've got a community to support us, to pray for us. It's important. When we're struggling, we don't have to go it alone. Not only is God always with us, but this is the place where the people are with you too. And if you're in one of those dark places today, I want you to grab a friend. Let them pray for you. I know it's hard, and sometimes you got to like, you know, oh, I don't know, it's kind of awkward. Can I ask? Okay? It's important. We can have peace and purpose in Christ, forgiveness when we fail, and clarity to see through all of the distractions. And so today I want you to just open your heart and invite God into all of those places where you need that hope. I know today I'm praying for the people who are having a hard time who are in some of those dark places. We all know them. Maybe some of you, you're like, I, I don't even know what's going on with everybody else. Frankly, that's just me today. And I've been in that funk place, and I feel like I haven't found the hope. But the invitation and the fresh word of life for us today is that Jesus is here. He's with us. He's going to walk us through it, and that we will be made new. And that we can look forward to the renewal of all things. Amen.